Good morning. Welcome members and friends and visitors to the First Presbyterian Church of Mattoon, Illinois. We pray that this morning our service is glorifying to God and that we also are welcomed by the Lord and by one another in this spiritual fellowship. The grace of God overflows for us through Christ Jesus, who came into the world to save sinners. Trusting in God's grace, let us confess our sins. Holy and merciful God, in your presence, we confess our failure to be what you created us to be. You alone know how often we have sinned in wandering from your ways and wasting your gifts and forgetting your love. By your loving mercy, help us to live in your light and abide in your ways for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Lord, have mercy. Christ, have mercy. Lord, have mercy. The mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting. I declare to you, in the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. And let us now affirm our faith together using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. You may be seated. And now as we prepare to hear the word read and proclaimed, let us pray. May the words of our mouths and the meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, Lord. You are author, redeemer, and friend. Amen. Uh, at my previous church, we had monthly sharing moments, and this is one that I shared in April of this year, and I would like to really emphasize that because it talks about me leaving, and I'm not. This is about me leaving the church previously. Um, and so I felt that it was important to share with you so that you could understand how Cora and I got here and how being here has been an absolute answer to our prayers. Um, Yes, here we go. Okay. I've entitled this God's Timing and the Season of Our Lives. And while I'll be talking about the past year of my life and what has led me to this very moment, I want you not to see me, not my feelings, not my experiences, and not anything other than what I feel has been God and the Holy Spirit leading me to this moment, a moment I believed would never arrive, the fact that Cora and I are leaving. Ecclesiastes 3, 1 through 5 and 8. For every season, or for everything there is a season, and a time for every matter under heaven, a time to be born, a time to die, a time to plant, and a time to pluck up what is planted, a time to kill, a time to heal, a time to break down, and a time to build up, a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance, a time to tear, and a time to sow. A time to keep silence and a time to speak, a time to love and a time to hate, a time for war and a time for peace. Over the past year, I felt that things were being stripped from my life. Odd jobs, important relationships, desires for certain hobbies, the, necess the ne necessity for me at my job. However, I always felt that I wasn't necessarily being led away from those things, but rather towards something but I could really never put my finger on what it was. Now I put those items on my list in a very flippant and concise way, but please understand that none of those things were taken or given away casually or without pain. 
All of it was leading me to this decision, a decision that would take us away from the place where I had spent the last seven years, effectively Cora's entire life, building a life with my daughter and my parents, relationships with the community members and members of the church, the youth, the school, and watching some of those things slip out of my fingers was incredibly painful. But somehow, there was an intense sense of peace about all of it, like I was going somewhere and God was leading the way. I just had no stinking idea where it was or where I would be going. I figured on something more metaphorical or spiritual, maybe even just mental. Yet I had no inspiration as to what I should be working towards. Should I go back to school for a new job? I scoured the internet, looking for ideas on what my new aspiration should be. Nothing. Silence. Not one little tug that said, this, this is it. This is what your next move is. In February, I became eligible to renew my Washington State teacher's license, which I did. And I submitted it to my employer. Three days later, my sister posted a job announcement that their church was looking for a youth director. And I knew in that moment, that was what my soul had been longing for. That was what God was leading me towards. I immediately applied for the job. I just knew in my heart of hearts that this is what I was supposed to do. And then I heard nothing for weeks. <laughs> was I wrong? Had I heard something that wasn't there? How had I been so certain and then been so wrong? And then I got an interview. That was the start. That Friday, I had my interview, and I loved the committee. The old, the young, oh, it, how it felt so good to have young people on the committee. It felt like kismet. And then again, nothing. Had I imagined how well it went? Had I put too much into the idea? Had I just been looking for a way out? Well, I decided God was asking me to take a leap of faith. If I felt this strongly that this is what I was supposed to be doing, I needed to book a flight to Illinois for over spring break. I needed to trust him enough that I was being led in the right direction and take a leap into faith. So I booked the tickets for Cora and I to fly to the church over spring break. And then I had my laundry list of, well, I can't do this unless, and I can't do that unless. And boy, was it a list. The schools, the session, the housing market, the salary, the people in the area, the feel and the build of the church, their willingness or unwillingness to grow. But once I took that leap of faith, God removed every single obstacle in the way, clearing a path forward and reassuring me every step of the way. Worries about taking a pay cut? I would get a video on Facebook talking about how to stick to a budget and how to make more money in your downtime. Concerns about the schools? The principal at the school knocked every single one of those concerns out of the water. The church? Although an aged congregation with very few younger people in it had a desire to grow and support someone with fresh and new ideas. Again, I was so certain that this is what God was leading me to do. And then the school announced salary increases. <laughs> Whoa, here I was looking at taking a pretty decent pay cut and they announced raises? Was I crazy? Was I leading myself and my daughter away from financial certainty? I just couldn't do it. I had to stay. Even if I wasn't going to be happy, we would be secure. I was reeling. I felt dizzy, stressed. All the uncertainty of the past few months came crashing back to me. But I put that aside so I could put Cora to bed. I settled up, I settled in and pulled up her devotion for that night. And this is what it said. Should I or shouldn't I? What if I do? What if I don't? How will it work out? What if it doesn't work out? What do I do? If you've got a choice to make, some of those th thoughts might be tearing around inside your brain, threatening to make your head explode. Whether it seems like a big decision to anyone else, to you, is it really a big deal? So what do you do? First, ask God for wisdom. James 1.5 says, If any of you lacks wisdom, he should ask God, who gives generously to all without finding fault, and it will be given to him. Easy, right? But then believe that he will answer. 
God loves to give out wisdom. God doesn't reluctantly say, well, I'm not sure I'll give her any of my wisdom. No, he's generous. So ask boldly, knowing he'll answer because he wants to. Then decide. Go ahead, choose. Don't second guess yourself. Don't doubt. Don't wonder, did I do the right thing? Just do it. That's the end of the devotional. Now it's me. <laughs> I had already prayed for wisdom, for a path, and with much discernment made the choice to go. God had made a path for me, and I needed to trust that. Trust that God would provide. Trust that I have been gifted with the skills to be successful in the future, and an immediate sense of relief flooded over me. I could keep going on about all the other signs that led me here. Reassured me the fears, the backstepping, the urges to trust, the urges to stop the train moving ahead, the urges to stay here with my parents. But the thing that stands out to me in the most uh, is whenever I trusted God and I trusted the path that was ahead of me, the immense sense of peace and fulfillment that flooded over me. And I just made another connection that's going to make me cry. <laughs> um, last week, so this would have been back in April, uh, during the service, we sang in Christ alone, which, if we're being honest, has always made me cry when we get to the fourth verse, when it talks about how no scheme of man can ever pluck us from his hand. But this time it was the first verse. In Christ alone, my hope is found. He is my light, my strength my song, this cornerstone, this solid ground, firm through the fiercest drought and storm, what heights of love, what depths of peace, when fears are stilled, when striving cease, my comforter, my all in all, here in the love of Christ I stand. If we can trust God through the scary stuff, the hard stuff, losing things that are immensely important to us, the leaps into faith, then he will reward us. I don't know where you are in your seasons of your life. If you're building up or tearing down, if you're at peace or at war, I just know that if you trust God and listen for his voice and have patience, he will answer. And now that we're here in this place, I know he's answered those prayers for me. Should I tell them? The connection I just had in my brain, one of my biggest fears was losing my parents because we'd be gone. And we just found out Thursday that in November, they're going to be moving here to Mattoon. <laughs> so they have quite a few things to wrap up, but then they're going to be coming here. <laughs> so, yeah. The Old Testament reading is from Isaiah 56, verses 1 and 6 through 8. Thus says the Lord, maintain justice and do what is right, for soon my salvation will come, my deliverance be revealed. And the foreigners who join themselves to the Lord, to minister to him, to love the name of the Lord, and to be his servants, all who keep the Sabbath and do not profane it, and hold fast my covenant, these I will bring to my holy mountain, and make them joyful in my house of prayer. Their burnt offerings and their sacrifices will be accept accepted at my altar. For my house shall be called a house of prayer for all peoples. Thus says the Lord God, who gathers the outcasts of Israel, I will gather others to them besides those already gathered. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. And our New Testament reading is from the Gospel according to Matthew, chapter 15, verses 21 to 28, and a little bit of context on the passage. It's preceded by a passage in which some Pharisees and religion scholars from Jerusalem had just come out to criticize Jesus and his disciples about their uh, unclean eating practices, that they were violating some of God's laws. They were actually human laws, but... Anyway, Jesus called the Pharisees out on their hypocrisy, that they were very good at looking righteous on the outside, but inside their hearts were proud. Jesus had said, it's not what you put in your mouth. It's not about what you eat that makes you unclean. It's what comes out of your heart 
and out of your mouth that makes you unclean. And so it's on the context of that. And in the Old Testament story, we're hearing about how God's plan is to bring all people together with the children of Israel into God's family. So Jesus went away to the district of Tyre and Sidon. That's a, a land of foreigners, right? It's not the, the Jewish people's land. Uh, and a Canaanite woman, a foreigner, a woman uh, from that region came out and started shouting, have mercy on me, Lord, son of David. My daughter is tormented by a demon. But Jesus did not answer her at all. And his disciples came and urged Jesus saying, send her away. She keeps shouting on after us. Jesus answered his disciples, I was sent only to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. But the Canaanite woman, she came and she knelt before Jesus and said to him, Lord, help me. He answered, it's not fair to take the children's food and throw it to the dogs. She said, yes, Lord. Yet even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Then Jesus answered her, Woman, great is your faith. Let it be done for you as you wish. And her daughter was healed from that moment. The gospel of the Lord. Parental love is a powerful force of nature when it's healthy, when it's real. Consider the fact that so often in the scriptures, God self-identifies as our father, as our mother. God's relationship towards humanity is very paternal and maternal. See how often in scripture, God refers to the people as his children. You and I, children of God, even in this passage, God's special relationship with the Israelites is likened to a parent with their children. And one of the rules established is that the children get fed first. And that's a truism that will resonate with every parent, and especially with that Canaanite mom who is seeking help from Jesus for her daughter, not for herself, for her daughter whom she loves. So she would understand what Jesus was saying. Is there anything that a parent won't do for their child? And certainly the parent wouldn't prioritize another person's wellness over the nourishment of their own beloved son or daughter. But I want to say that you and I are in on something that the disciples weren't in on back then. They didn't understand that the Messiah was going to be bringing in everybody. They were still under the idea that, you know, God was coming to minister to the Jewish people first and then everyone else after that. But Jesus was subversive. <laughs> Jesus was trying to open them up too to understand all people are my children. But Jesus kind of was having to teach that in sometimes shocking ways that they didn't expect. And in this instance, I think Jesus was kind of acting like a parrot. Not a parent, a parrot of the religious people. Here's what religious people sound like. Well, there's a certain order to things. The children get fed first, then everybody else. And I think maybe the Canaanite woman caught on to what he was doing. He's, he's like, you're not like that. <laughs> you're not as dry and terrible as the religious people make you out to be. You're rich in mercy, aren't you? You're the Messiah for the whole world. And Jesus is kind of like, yeah, I am. And you see that. And so your faith is better than some people that are claiming to be my children because you're seeing things that they're not seeing. It's not a coincidence that Matthew places this story of the healing of the Canaanite woman's daughter right after he was having issues with the religious know-it-alls from his own people, right? The children of Israel. Sometimes the people who seem on the outside to be closest to God are actually far from God's heart. It's not the outside appearance that God looks at, but it's the heart. I need to credit the late pastor and writer Eugene Peterson for some wonderful insights into this passage, along with some help that I received throughout the week from my friends and family. For one thing, this story is shocking. Let's admit from the get-go, we know that it's out of character for Jesus to behave this way towards an outsider, right? The reason that it's shocking to us what Jesus said is like, that doesn't sound like Jesus at all. That's the point, right? He's not as stuffy 
as the religious people make him sound out to be. But once that initial shock wears off, let's, let's see what the story wants to work on us. Sometimes you and I come bef- to Jesus and we have a request. Please fix this. And just like the Canaanite woman in the story, what we are met with is the silence of Jesus. The silence. God, fix this. Silence. And the disciples are kind of feeling the tension. Can you do something, Jesus? Can you fix this? She's bothering us. You know, give her what she wants and send her away. And then Jesus kind of parrots the, you know, the Pharisees, you know, well, is this right? Is this the right thing to do? And then that wonderful woman has the chutzpah, the courage, the boldness to go directly to Jesus, to bypass the disciples and go right in front of Jesus on her knees and says, help me. And that's a good thing to do. I think that this Canaanite woman probably reminds Jesus of the woman in his parable, the persistent widow that is clamoring and knocking for justice and won't give up. And Jesus is so charmed by that Canaanite woman's faith. It's like, you didn't give up in the silence. And when the disciples were kind of trying to shoo you away, you didn't give up on the relationship. Oh, like we could be like that as well and not give up so easily. Maybe sometimes in the silence, there was time to recognize, you know what? You are God and you are Lord. You're more than just a fixer. God, you are more than just one that I run to when things are broken, when my toys are smashed. God, please fix it for me. Okay, ding, good, we're done. And I can go off and be, do my own thing again. God, you're my fixer. Something's wrong. Come and help me. Cha-ching, fixed. Great, thanks. See you later. No, instead we, we sit for a moment. What does it mean to say, Lord? You know everything. You know what's best. Maybe that silence gives us time to say, okay, you're Lord. You know, rather than getting huffy, or self-important, or presumptuous, the Canaanite woman showed incredible deference and respect to Jesus, along with good humor and a quick wit. She actually does treat Jesus like Lord, not just with lip service, but with great respect. She allowed Jesus to have a chance to test her faith a little bit. And just as he did with the Samaritan woman in John 4, so also Jesus does establish the fact that, yes, salvation comes from the Jews, that the law and the prophets and the Messiah, they all came into the world through Israel, first to the children, then to everyone else, that God had a plan from the start. But she also knew that Jesus was willing to bend the human rules a little bit to make way for God's plan. The way that she actually responds shows how highly she thinks of Jesus right after we saw how lowly the religious know-it-alls thought about Jesus. How often do we take God for granted? How often do we come before the Lord presumptuously and arrogantly saying, fix it or else? I'm ditching you, God. That's not how the Canaanite woman approached Jesus humbly, trusting that God's way is best. Not offended by Jesus, but trusting him. The Canaanite woman's faith might put our own faith to shame. It does mine at times, because I'm not very patient. But true faith is, and Jesus saw true faith, and he responded by healing the daughter from her demon possession, from healing her from that that illness, that brokenness, instantly. And what is a miracle really except the bending of the rules, <laughs> right? When you're asking for a miracle, you're asking God to bend the rules a little bit for you, right? Yeah. Three takeaways from today's scripture. I know we like that. God's plan from the beginning has been to save all people. God chose to start 
first through Abraham's descendants. But as we saw in the Old Testament scripture and in the scriptures for today, it's for all people. We're all children, okay? It's not children and dogs. It's all children. God's plan from the beginning has been to save all of us. That's number one. Two, the question for us, how do we approach Jesus? Do we take Jesus for granted? Do we think of Jesus as our fixer or our Lord? Do we trust him or do we only trust him when he does what we want him to do? Thirdly, God can and will deliver those who seek help from him, who seek him first. When you put Jesus first, everything else gets in its proper place. When it's out of order, it's all mixed up. If you're giving God terms and conditions of your trust, that's not faith. I will follow you, Jesus, if this happens. I will follow you if you do this, this, and that's not faith. Trust that God knows better than we do. Trust that God can and will deliver us. It might not be the help that we're asking for, but it will be the help that we need. It's what God does over and over again, because God is a good parent who loves the children, who won't take, <laughs> who won't take the children's food and throw it away, who gives us so much more than crumbs, so much more than crumbs. That Canaanite woman, all she was asking for was for crumbs. She got a lot more than that, didn't she? Let's pray. Holy God, sometimes maybe we ask you for too little. We want you to fix circumstances, but you want to fix us. And so, God, please, we trust you. Give us what we need instead of just what we want. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.